So I, I know this is something probably off the beaten track in terms of a question, but I remember a long time ago when we were, we took the subway back uptown together after a lesson one time, and, um, and you mentioned that you were a Korean War veteran, and we started talking about that because my dad is a Vietnam vet, and um, I always kind of wondered, how, how does that work when you're a musician? Like, how, how does that go hand in hand at all? Did you, do you practice? Do you play? I mean, was your role during that just performing, or, how, or were you in boot camp? I was remarkably fortunate. Mm -hmm. um, as you mentioned, the Korean War was mm -hmm. going, and uh, my friends many of whom were older than me, some of them graduating, and they were afraid of being drafted mm -hmm. and going to, to Korea to fight. Um, and so they were auditioning and enlisting for the special so-called band, the Marine Band, which mm -hmm. is the uh, president's own. Right. Um, and so I had a couple of friends in the West Point Band, mm -hmm. and another good friend of mine said that he was going to audition. Well, I had just finished one year of Juilliard. I was 18 and I really wanted to get away from home, get away from the school, mm -hmm. uh, get away from it all. And so I felt, well, this was a very good way. My parents really couldn't object to my being in the West Point band and not going to Korea. So I auditioned for that and of course they did not have a table of organization for stringed instruments mm -hmm. that you had to play a band instrument. Uh -huh. And so I was assigned to learn the piccolo. Oh, you're kidding me. Um, and after eight weeks of infantry basic training, which was a learning experience, uh, it was during the summer, it was hot, and marching with full backs, uh, and mostly living with people who you would never otherwise have come into contact with. So it was eye-opening. And the struggle, I mean, to, on a hot day, you carry just a canteen of water. Um, and so you got to know what it was to have a little bit of hardship. Um, at any rate, I went to West Point after basic training, and it was not what I had visualized at all. Uh, and uh, uh, it was not a musical experience whatsoever. And after about six or seven months there, um, with sort of a disagreement with what was going on, um, I found myself on orders uh, to go overseas. And they had just organized in Germany a symphony orchestra. And the army, American army in Europe at the time was the Seventh Army. And it was called the Seventh Army Symphony. Supposedly it came about with my good friend uh, uh, Sam Adler, uh, the composer who did write a work for us, um, that a commanding general uh, entertaining some German friends, the subject came up of what do you think of the American soldiers? You know, they're very nice and so on and so on, but they have no culture. And so the general apparently picked up the phone the next morning and said, I want an orchestra. <laughs> as though you could really do this, but I guess in the army you could. Well, that was part of my good fortune. And so hearing that I would probably be going to the Seventh Army Symphony, I started to practice for the first time in a year uh, and stuffed the violin case into my duffel bag uh, and left some clothing that I should have been carrying instead with me. And... Um, found myself outside of Stuttgart, Germany, uh, and auditioned, and I was concert master of the orchestra, and, uh, and playing various solos with the orchestra. And we felt really blessed that this was, you know, a pretty wonderful way to be spending your time in the, yeah. in the army, <laughs> when it, it could have been a lot less a lot fortunate worse. than that. Yeah. But it also was life-changing, uh, performing in Germany at that time, which was the mid-50s. Uh, it was part of the German e economic miracle. We were basically performing for German audiences. Relatively few of the concerts were for GIs. And this is before television. 
the concerts were free, the audiences were really appreciative, enthusiastic, something that I'd never felt in the States. And as I said, this is life changing, made me feel completely differently about music and that this is something I really, really want to do and not run away from. Of course, there are many anecdotes I could tell you, but... Uh, tell me one. One of the people uh, in the orchestra got one of those uh, sort of large teddy bears <laughs> and became very much attached to the teddy bear and would bring the teddy bear on stage. <laughs> And then another one of the guys got another teddy bear, and they had the one was called oh they were called onward and forward, and uh, some people in the orchestra thought this is totally nuts, and others thought no this is the way they would go, and uh, so we played our concerts and had the teddy bears, and then there was a very very good violist who visited us, but he was with uh, army intelligence and they had a higher priority than we did. And although he wanted to go to the Seventh Army, intelligence would release him. Well, he bought a teddy bear. And <laughs> now the Army has regulations about dogs and cats and fish and so on, but there are no regulations about having a teddy bear. So there was nothing they could do to him. And he would take it to the mess hall for his meals, and everywhere on his Army post he carried his teddy bear. And, well, pretty soon he was called in by the army psychiatrist. And uh, he spoke very frankly about his attachment to the teddy bear. And the next day, he found himself on orders to the Seventh Army Symphony. <laughs> <laughs> One of the conductors was a protege of Dmitry Metropolis, named Jim Dixon. He was a good conductor, and Metropolis uh, came over a couple of times to see him, and one of the uh, visits, he threw a party, a dinner party for the entire orchestra in a gestet, gestet a restaurant, mm -hmm. and um, it was just really generous of him and very, very lovely, mm -hmm. and after that he gathered all of us together to give us a speech about music. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, that was a, a very, very moving experience. It was very young, mm -hmm. but uh, I wish I could have heard it, hear it again now, because I'm sure I'd be hearing it with uh, even more appreciation than I did then. Uh, so there were many, many, many wonderful uh, experiences that way. Uh, another, I had been teaching in Salzburg, uh, during the summers for about 20 years. And the orchestra had, for two summers, played in the Passau Festspiel, Passau Festival, uh, which we loved. We stayed at a Schuleheim, which was an orphanage. Uh, and Passau is the confluence of three rivers, uh, the Rhine, the Ilse, and the Inn. And uh, we would play our concerts and then walk back, which is, I guess, about a mile, and stop at a restaurant and play again, drink beer and so on until who knows what, one or two in the morning. Uh, but, you know, we were, we were very young, and this was just a wonderful, wonderful uh, release. Well, I hadn't been back to Passau for 40 or 50 years, and I'm in Salzburg, and it's a rainy Saturday, and I've taught in the morning, and I said to my wife, Adrian, let's Let's go to Passau. It didn't look that far, and I had a rented car. Well, it was twisting road, took a little longer than I thought. And needless to say, you couldn't recognize anything. You know, everything, everywhere has changed. And so I stopped a jeweler's, and a man I would guess was 40 or 50. And I said, I had been in the army orchestra here at the Passau Festival, and never heard of it. We played our concerts in a place called the Sportspalast. Never heard of it. We stayed at the Schuleheim along the river. Never heard of it. He was so frustrated. He really wanted to help. He said, I know what. Go just 100 meters away is the information center for NASA. They will know. They will help you.
So I went and I repeated the same story. And it was a girl, probably late 20s, and of course she'd never heard of any of this. And then the moment of life change came, she said, I know what, I'll call my grandmother. <laughs>